All right. Hello, my name is Raylan Crow, and I am presenting for the Connect and Disconnect. Living through times of social disruption. Living through times of social disruption. So whenever you paint, you got to start out with a blank canvas, obviously. Uh, next slide. Um, here's the final look. Here's the final project of the of the painting. Um, I started out with a few circles. Um, I am a Yakima Nation descendant. My mom is a full member of the Yakima tribe. Um, and I decided to do this painting based on my descendancy and her descendancy within the tribe or um, connection to the tribe. And circles are really important to us based on how we view time and how we view um, life in general. So I started out with a few of these circles. Next slide. Um, mapping out, um, I have three different circles here. I have um, one here at the bottom and I have two that are split up into four different squares. And I try to make it as geometrical as possible um, to kind of visualize different kinds of divides between um, colonial culture, which is one part of my heritage and the other side, the Yakima Nation side. So I originally started out, if you guys are familiar with the Native American movement of missing and murdered indigenous women, um, I started out with my own handprint and the rep yeah. <laughs> it represents my mom and um, the orange represents the usual, um, the, the social movement for indigenous women. So I painted it first with orange. Here's the finished product. And then um, on the other side is my hand and I only did half of it because I'm only half Yakima native. And then the other half is um, more of a skin tone color to represent the other part of my heritage. And then next slide. And then I started with the blood quantum. The blood quantum is a colonial framework that is imposed on indigenous tribes um, that is now embedded in the indigenous tribal culture to determine if you are eligible enough to be Native American or not and get the funding that you need and to be a part of the tribe. Um, then I start with the um, Native American symbolisms of, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the medicine wheel, but that usually, um, represents the different kinds of, I can't remember right now. <laughs> it represents different kinds of uh, cultural religious symbolisms. Next slide. So usually black, red, yellow, and white is what are the colors that we use most frequently in my culture. We can go to the next slides. And then I start, I forgot to uh, do the last one really quick in that photo. Then I start with the last circle of geological time. So the indigenous framework for time is not linear like a Western um, idea of time. And background, I am an archeologist, so I do have to study um, material remains through time. And we use that colonial framework to look at that kind of stuff. And I wanted to represent how indigenous people see time and how it's more circular and embedded on top of each other rather than just a straight line. Um, the last circle is the, um, I'm starting with the, with the Yakima tribe uh, flag and symbol. Um, we have an arrowhead where the Yakima tribes of confederation started in 1885. And that is important to keep in mind because that was when the, the federal government was saying that we don't really want to recognize tribes and they like clumped them all together into a reservation and only gave seven tribes federal recognition. Next slide. Oh, okay, sweet. This is my favorite part. Um, and then I decided to talk about my own history and my own um, kind of understanding of my, of the indigenous history. I really wanted to symbolize using red because of the genocide of Native American peoples. And then I kind of more use that handprint to kind of make it a little bit more gory, I guess. And then try to make it as messy as possible because that's how genocide is. Next slide. And then I didn't do it as much as on my hand. I only carry that descendancy. My mom had to go through it. Next one. And then I use black for a similar representation of disease and how it wiped out most of my culture. And the the red and the black are overlapping the whole entire history because it represents the um, contact and wiping out most of the Native American peoples. Next slide. 
Um, lastly, I used white oil paint instead of white acrylic paint to represent my own distances between my own heritage in my white community and the Native American community. I can't be accepted into my community because of my skin color. And the white community doesn't accept me very much as well because I don't look white enough. So I decided to use white oil paint for that because it was um, one fitting into the Native American theme of colors that I used and oil just in nature contradicts acrylic colors. And then lastly, the boxes kind of represent the divide between tribal members and um, set, uh, settlers. Yeah. Next slide. There's me with the painting. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the Dis uh, Connect and Disconnect panel. My name is Destiny Stilwa, pronouns are she, her. And this is my third year, year, year here at Central Washington University. I'm majoring in anthropology. I created this video as a final project for visual anthropology with Professor Peterson. She asked us to catch life on the fly in Ellensburg, whatever that meant to each of us. Um, Many of us, myself included, have had huge lifestyle, lifestyle changes since the COVID-19 pandemic. Isolation can drastically change people, especially those who are neurodivergent or struggle with mental health disorders. I wanted to capture how people have coped over the last two years, and luckily my friend Adia was the perfect example. Adia identifies as non-binary, so please, for any questions, use they, them pronouns. They have been using self-tattooing self as a coping mechanism. I wanted to not only capture the story of this tattoo, but also the larger social issues around tattoos themselves. The pandemic has opened up a lot of people to self-expression, and tattoos are a huge part of that for Adia. Once again, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy. Oh, my God. Look at this. I just don't get what his problem is. Dude, I have an idea. Oh my God. It's good to go. Look at this. I just don't get what his problem is. Dude, I have an idea. <laughs> jam holes through bags but it's still sanitary like there yeah that's good or like up here because this one has more space Oh, God, please tell me I'm not laid on. 
only ones in this situation Just when I think of you My fingers started shaking I've known you for two days I'm sorry I forgot your name And it's all your fault But just Ouchie, ouchie. The first line always hurts the worst. You need distractions? Yes. Why did you start tattooing? As a coping mechanism, so I would cut myself. And why do you, why do you feel like you have the need to do that? Um, I'm just very mentally ill, and I take it out on myself. When did you start this journey of tattooing yourself? Um, in January, and it is the beginning of April, right? So what's the story with this quote here from your dad? My dad just really doesn't believe in mental illness, which is very frustrating. And this is a way to remind myself that that's just how he is. And that's okay and that's a part of me. Where do you get your style inspiration for some of your other tattoos? Um... I really like the new wave of skate style tattoos and like the random placement. Um, but most of it is just stuff I drew because I really like my own art more than anybody else's art for some reason. What do you think about the stigmatism behind people who are heavily tattooed or have tattoos in exposed areas? Um, I honestly, I don't get it. I think tattoos are so cool. And I think expressing yourself is like, one of the main points of being a person. And I want to get completely covered. I want to get face tattoos and everything. And there's, Tattoo concealer now, so it doesn't even matter anymore. It's like you can cover it up so easily. Why not? Will your dad be seeing this tattoo at some point? Oh, for sure. And what do you think he'll say? Um, I don't think he'll say anything about it. I think he'll just be disappointed, but he's really worried because. We're not very close, and he gets really scared that we're just never going to talk again. How difficult is it to, you know, start up this process and buy all this materials? And what motivated you to, to take that big step? Um, honestly, I got an Amazon gift card for my grandma, and it was enough mixed with all the other Amazon gift cards I saved to get all of this stuff, which was several hundred dollars and took a lot of time to practice, but it takes up most of my time, so it feels worth it. What was your biggest worry when starting this process? Um, I am very worried about cleanliness especially because it's going in my blood. So I need to make sure that everything is sanitized because I'm, I'm really scared about that. And I like to tattoo my friends and I don't want to hurt my friends. So um, that and probably just messing up. Is tattooing something that you see for your future? Um, just casually. I want to be a family therapist, but college also sucks. So if that doesn't work out, 
I would definitely pursue tattooing. All done? I don't know yet. First wipe. Gonna hurt. Really good. Hold <laughs> on. So I started. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. My name is Brittany, um, and I'm going to be presenting my video. And uh, currently, there seems to be a lot of discussion uh, surrounding motherhood. And in the video, I talk about intensive mothering. And um, specifically like the, the cultural notions and kind of uh, the pressures that I felt during the pandemic. And so this is my um, auto ethnography on that situation and or that whole time period. And it seems like as of this year, I've finally been able to kind of process um, what motherhood was like during the pandemic. my bachelor's degree in winter quarter of 2020 and so right around this time two years ago was when the pandemic had started and I had also just recently given birth to my daughter the year before in 2019 and then we each have a child from a previous giving birth is such a unique experience it's like in, indescribable nothing compares to it it transforms your body and your mind once the baby is born so is the mother is a major turning point in my life even a change in how you see yourself and what you're capable of it's like a new social relationship where you experience things with a whole new level of emotional intensity, nurturing, selflessness. So you have these expectations as to what kind of mother you're going to be, but society does too. It seems like these pressures, they seem to become more intense once you try to go to school and work and be a mom. This sort of unconscious archetype as to what like a good mother is. And it's like, we need to be all these things all the time in all the ways. And I know that's impossible, but it's, it's really hard not to fall into that kind of thinking because it doesn't feel like society values our role as mothers or like the, the job that we are undertaking. I don't even think we even know what we're undertaking, you know, when we decide to have kids or give birth and all of that. Like, I mean, yeah, you can read a bunch of books, but you really have no idea what you're getting yourself into. I mean, you know, looking back, you can think of all these things, oh, you know, I would tell my younger self this and this and this but it's really easy to forget that society has a role in all of this as well motherhood is filled with dichotomies 
there's this enormous love that we have for our kids but the overwhelm and frustration when sometimes we just don't want anything to do with them i was supposed to graduate this quarter i ended up dropping a class and so i'll graduate next quarter um, i learned that 17 credits is impossible with kids and looking back through this whole journey that i've gone on to get this bachelor's degree i did most of my work during a pandemic with three kids and I don't know how I did that. Um, I can say that it did come at a cost of uh, my mental health. I figured out this social ideology that I'm describing and it's called intensive mothering. And it's where you give all of your time, energy, financial, all your resources into raising your children. And it stems from the end of the Second World War, oddly enough, when, you know, the men are coming back and the women are expected to leave the workforce and go back home where they are needed. Now I know the secret behind the system of ideas and ideals that has created this ingrained concept. It takes away its power. They say that it takes a village to raise a child, but it actually takes a village to raise a mother. Motherhood is a constant learning process and we need other mothers around us to help us grow and be successful. And I am so grateful for the village of mothers still raising me. Hi, my name is Caleb. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, second of all, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and be here with everyone else. Uh, they crushed it. <laughs> um, so I think by now it's pretty clear that like COVID built up these like barriers we all have, and it's different for each of us. Um, for me, I was living this largely sedentary life. I mean. I graduated high school and I came up here for what, five months, six months, and then straight back down to Kent, working the same job I hated, living in my elementary school home with a bed where my knees hung off the end. And um, I, had, I didn't have any of my friends up here and it was, it was rough. So I got into this like hobby of vicariously traveling the world. Um, so I, I did that by collecting Blu-rays of documentaries and uh, tucked away in the discount bin of Scarecrow Video was less blank, always for pleasure. Um, this Blu-ray collection, uh, I think everyone should own, but um, these films just radiate like fun pleasure and and personality i fell in love with the director and i watched all 22 of the films in this box in one day um they're not very long but um it really gave me this idea of open door philosophy i mean enjoying life as it comes and sometimes uh people look at these films and they and they view it in a very one-sided romantic way and the filmmaker himself Les Blank he uh admits to this and he he knows what his films are they deal with nothing but 
pleasure and enjoyment. But he also embraces that. He, there's nothing really wrong with that in his mind because he's not trying to show people living. He's trying to show people enjoying living. Um, so after I, I watched these, I went back to work and I had a different mindset. They, they started calling me a Mr. Smiley because I had this uh, thing where even if a customer screamed at me because their food was 30 minutes late, I would never not smile. Um, and I would enjoy time with my friends more and stop dwelling on the fact that I was stuck down in Kent because of COVID. And I know this is a very first world problem. I mean, I boohoo, I have a job and I can't hang out with my friends at college. But um, yeah, it, it really did change how I look at the world. And um, so I made this little retrospective uh, just to appreciate the films and spread them to a wider audience. So I, I hope everyone enjoys. Filmmaker, ethnographer, poet, and musician Les Blank produced, edited, directed, and funded more than 40 films throughout his entire life. Les Blank covered subjects that he personally felt captured his passion for embracing diverse cultural lifestyles. Between covering soul-driven musicians, polka parties, and women excelling in unconventional beauty standards, I personally found this series of films in Louisiana particularly striking. Spend It All, Always for Pleasure, Hot Pepper, Dry Wood, and Yum Yum Yum, A Taste of Cajun and Creole Cooking, dive deep into Louisiana culture and show the diverse ethnography and appreciation Link has for the region. While these films strive to show America's excellent diversity and unique subcultures, they all share one thing in common, a romantic outlook on the universal pleasure of living. First and foremost, it's hard to ignore the incredibly lively and vivacious music that encircles these films. From the dynamic and vibrant zydeco that scatters the Creole country to the high-spirited jazz that permeates the soulful New Orleans neighborhood, the music blends perfectly into Blank's unique cinematography approach and embodies his soulful personality. This up-close and personal approach always attempts to make the viewer feel as if they can hear the cheerful music themselves. He encourages his subjects to use his camera as a platform and tell jokes, collaborative stories, or show off. While the personal cinematography puts a spotlight on the wonderful people of Louisiana, Blank does not shy away from showcasing the wonderful world that people live in. The Louisiana Bayou, Creole Country, New Orleans architecture, and steamy kitchens filled with laughing families are all cultural backdrops that ooze pleasure and tradition. Les Blank's films in Louisiana are the essence of free living a community that is not burdened by acceptance or failure. And they're about borrowing the earth and learning to enjoy what resources are given to you rather than worry about their scarcity. It's rare you see a scene where someone isn't smiling and laughing or enjoying each other's company, whether they're black, Cajun, Creole, or Chicano. You could tell that making these films was fun because of the people's willingness to adapt, share, and express themselves. Steep tradition, but not weighed down by it just adapting to be as happy and carefree as possible. These films make you want to get on a flight to Louisiana just to experience how that life is all about yourself. While some people criticize Blank for romanticizing Louisiana and its subjects, it's clear that he's not trying to suggest how this is everyone in Louisiana. It's just the little moments of people enjoying themselves and their company, of which he cherishes so much. Breaking away from material culture and advantages and living an honest, rewarding life accolades in food, music, and love. Like a hungry Mardi Gras drunk, the atmosphere in these films eats you whole and envelops what you thought you knew about Louisiana and spits it out in a new inspirational light. It makes you want to dance, laugh, and cook with your family and the ones you love. It makes you want to help your neighbor mow the lawn or build something. And it makes me envy the fact that this is a life I could be living, but I'm not taking the chance. Now, while I can't uproot my entire life and move to Louisiana like I'd love to, uh, Les Blank was kind enough to leave a recipe for red beans and rice from his film Always for Pleasure uh, that he served during Mardi Gras. So uh, let's make some beans. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
just, I'm gonna like kill myself. <laughs> There was a one too many Miller High Life consumed that night. I'm going to pull up a Nils, our next presenter. He's on Zoom. So go ahead and take it away, Nils. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Um, you can. Awesome. Um, okay, so uh, I, I did a, um, well, I guess I'll preface with, um, I did an ethnography and all ethnography is somewhat experimental, but I'm definitely interested in pushing the bounds of the experiments of ethnography and combining it with um, more of the, uh, the cultures that I've already kind of inhabited for most of my adult life in um, countercultures of music and art and uh, looking at the way people survive in the peripheries of society and how a lot of these cultural like and um, artistic forms sometimes end up shaping more mainstream thought in a larger discourse of like national and international um, trends. So my, my video is uh, looking at my move to New York City, moving into Brooklyn that I did last year. Um, not really on a whim, but definitely a little bit of a just kind of throwing caution to the wind and, and going out there. And in it, um, moving to one of the densely, most densely populated areas in the world and feeling isolation, but then looking at what it takes to actually create and realizing that collaboration is a very big part of that. Um, with that being said, it was very experimental in that I didn't know too much what I was doing. I was filming with um, a camcorder that I had kind of inherited from my grandparents. And um, also in trying to transfer the footage digitally, it didn't look like sound was working. So I wasn't paying attention to what I was talking about with the friends that I was with. And through that, it ended up that I got the sound to work. And so I was able to kind of like see this dialogue that I wasn't intending about how we talked about how much collaboration, especially in the arts, is vital to actually having things work. Um, on top of all that, part of the experimental ethnography I'm interested in is showing a way to show what artists actually do create, especially in music. So you are going to hear some music in this that is something that I have recorded and I, I chose to use my own music in this one because it is very much about my journey and it's a very um, reflexive ethnography, um, still impressionistic. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen and 
Let me know if that comes up. We're good? Yeah, okay. You can control the volume? Yeah, I'll do it in here. Go ahead and start it. Okay. Ooh. The frames are pretty bad, Nils. Yeah, sound isn't working either. Will you just send the link in the Zoom and I'll put it up on here? I can do that, yeah. Yeah, that might just be easier. There you go. All right. kind of like a cool team to like between the two of us we're gonna get like a really great capture right so like I'm hoping that we can like form a cool partnership that yeah. way kind of like what we already have in music where I mean he's just such a prolific songwriter and yeah. does such amazing things that that like I can never do but I also understand that I make his songs better right you know, when he lets me filter his songs through my perspective, I can add so much to it. I love that. I love that someone's open to that. Yeah. Not everyone Not is. Everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> but that realization with like the Wes Anderson stuff yeah. was uh, that I think I like that. I want to, and actually I didn't bring it with me, but I, I have a tripod. I think I want to just set up and do Start still, just very still shots.
be a filmographer on your own. It's really hard. I can't drive myself and try to film shit. I mean, you can't. I guess you can. Yeah, I believe so. We were all in high class group for this. But that was actually an exercise, the first exercise. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, well then it was so just a creative project at the end. So I think we were pretty much allowed to do whatever. Yeah, we watched a lot of different styles of anthropological and ethnographic film and throughout the quarter, and we were supposed to take what we had gathered from these and produce our own um, interpretation or our own, you know, I did a, a respective, yeah, so something similar. And I, it didn't have to be a film either, it's something visual though. Yeah, I took a very different take on the visual anthropology part because when I first signed up for the class, because um, I come from, I've never taken a cultural anthropology class before, especially at this kind of level of detail. So I thought visual anthropology meant like literally looking at an archaeological record and looking at the artwork of that time period. So I decided to like take my own spin on visual anthropology and um, take it, which is a hobby I think that really makes me better. I have to answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> There's any questions online too? Just yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just show them. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. For real. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to everyone on Zoom. <laughs>